I'm Kelly Harrell, author, animist, and creator of the Weekly Rune. Solenton Arts is my soul-tending practice, and you're listening to What in the Weird, my podcast in which I talk about runes, actionable animism, soul-tending, and how all of those intersect through sacred activism on my path. The Weekly Rune is out, and if you're not sure what it is, it's a rune cast that I've done for years, focused on the runic calendar and the current half-month rune. The Weekly Rune is now available in full on Patreon.com. Just do a search for Kelly Harrell to find it, and you can find the archive of all past rune casts on my site, soulintentarts.com. If you're not sure what a half-month is or what the runic calendar is, Listen to the early episodes of What in the Weird, or just go read the weekly rune. It's explained fully at the beginning of every runecast. I want to thank everyone who listens to the podcast, those who send in notes. I always enjoy hearing from you and how the runes touch your life. I also want to thank my Patreon supporters who make the sharing of my rune work through the runecast and this podcast possible with their financial support. If you've benefited from the podcast, the RuneCast, or the ton of free articles on the runes, animism, and soul tending on my website, you can show your support through buying my books, which you can also find at my website, soulintentarts.com, by making a one-time contribution through PayPal, or contributing regularly through Patreon. Just go to patreon.com and search for Kelly Harrell, and you can also subscribe to the weekly rune there and thank you for it. The current half-month rune is Nauthis, which traditionally is accepted as meaning needfire, all in one word. Needfire, as in fire that is needed, as in sacrifice and expenditure, which means by default something beyond the norm in giving up assets or energy to evoke a change. What does that sound like? Ritual, right? We've internalized ritual as habit, this thing that we do over and over ad nauseum. And our modern human association with setting something as a habit implies that it's rote. We just do it. No thought, no intention, no soul. That's not what need fire is. And that's not what effective soul rituals are either. So let's talk about what all of that really is with Nadis. Need fire is a f- ancient fire ritual of the Germanic and Northern European cultures. And what makes it unique is that it was this focused parade of cattle and sometimes people driven through fire to ward off disease and bad luck. It's essentially fire walking with the intention of clearing beings, in other words. The prevailing way that this practice was presented was through the lens of driving out evil spirits. And and of course, that's not the way that it was recorded by cultures who did this practice. And it was actually done up until relatively recently. And, And some Northern European cultures still do it symbolically, whether it retains that um, same spiritual depth, who's to say. But this is the way it's been permeated into modern culture. And so that practice of burning plant matter for some sort of spiritual shift, what does that sound like? When we engage plant spirits, and with their permission, burn herbs or other plants to clear ourselves, space, patterns, yeah. And I'm not saying that one specific word on principle. You know the one I'm talking about. And if you don't, you have to email me to find out. But something else to understand about this process of engaging fire and plant spirits for human benefit Um understand that the church took on that practice with burning incense and resins 
Just saying. So Need Fire has always been presented with this one foot out, like heresy, wives tale, derogatory spin. And over the last few years, we've come to understand more about combining plants and fire and the benefit that they have. We know that some plant spirits that have been historically engaged in this kind of ritual with humans are going extinct. That's a thing. We know that um, some plant spirit relationships are considered in, endangered because as these practices have become more mainstream, the people who have relationships to these plant spirits and this kind of process for thousands of years, by which I mean indigenous people, find that the relationships are strained with these plant spirits now. So that is an aspect of working with plants in this way. We've also learned that using plants and fire, certain plants at least, does actually kill some germs and bacteria. That's a thing where science and uh, what has been considered woo crazy stuff has, has met at an intersection. Google it. So that's awesome. It is the redeeming of a practice that was demonized and deemed uncivilized for thousands of years. Sacred for the church, but if everybody else does it, they're uncivilized. So what does that have to do with Northeast now? We have our own approaches to dealing with maladies in our lives. We've got cold medicine, tea lights, room spray, why do we need to understand the significance of Nathis and ritual in order to eliminate things or rebalance things in our lives? Need fire, whether in the way it was practiced in those cultures, like did they know it killed off germs? Maybe they did. Whether the fire actually drove out harmful spirit beings or it was just symbolic of faith in turning hard conditions over to the powers that be. You know, what what really emerges when we sit with Nathis as part of this process of combining fire and ritual to an outcome, what we have is ritual and boundaries. And the really important takeaway is that both of these things require each other. One cannot healthily exist without the other. I know, I know. Stay with me. You'll see where I'm going. So in modern paganism, we've come to view rituals as extremely formulated. They're these trite, generic recipes we can just copy from the internet, do some sacred shopping to get the implements, and then replicate them in the living room. Whether you like your rituals completely organic and created on the fly based on the intention that's at hand, or if you prefer tried and true methodology is not the point. For those in the back, one more time, it's not about rituals being completely organic or based on intention. Um, it's not about them being repetitive and tried and true. Both of those approaches have value. There is deep relationship in approaching it from a dynamic way. There is also deep faith and trust in approaching rituals that we know have stood the test of time. That's a different discussion for a different episode. What I'm getting at with this whole discussion is that our rituals can be very rote. The way that they have been handed to us in modern paganism has become very rote. And in order for them to really do the job, whether it is one that is dynamically created or one that was given to you by your great-great-grandmother, it can't be this crap that you repeat over and over. Like it, it cannot be approached that way, even if you believe in it, even if you totally buy into it and you're just kind of going down the list and, you know, hitting all the highlights, you have to feel that ritual. You have to be able to find yourself in that ritual as well as the life force of each aspect of the ritual, the words, the intention, the tools that you use, the space. Uh, any other beings that are participating with you, yourself, you see where I'm going with this. It's about direct relationship to the moment. That 
is what makes it animistic. Even the ritual itself is its own life force. It is a being participating in this intersection of worlds. It's true embodiment. So let's back up for just a second. The powers that be thought it was important enough to include in the runic lexicon for humanity a rune that means ritual. And the ritual that so impressed upon the psyches of humans was the one of need fire. Why? Most likely a few reasons. Some we'll never know, and some are ones that I am taking from our academic knowledge of Nauthese and figuring out what it really means, what value it has to how we work with it now. Nauthese is a perfect example of humans recognizing the end of their resources in an area. They saw that they were sick and needed spiritual intervention. They saw that they were lacking and needed higher help. They've taken the tinctures, they've tended the ailing, they've done the hygiene, and they needed the spirit's involvement. And who's to say that doing all of those things isn't completely balanced? Like it isn't a situation where they looked up and thought, hey, we're screwed, but they were already implementing all of these things. And the spiritual layer is just another part of that. But the question that emerges is why don't the spirits just know? Like, why do we have to do something to call them in? You know, why didn't they just have the speed dial and already know what we needed and give it and the humans were doing their thing and everything would be fine? Well, because it doesn't work that way, even though that's what we've been spoon fed. We download our rituals. We just assume that our guides or or however you want to phrase them, our spirit allies already know what we need without us having to ask. Well, for most of us, our partner doesn't even know what we need without having to ask. And being able to ask means that you know what you need. It's the same way with our spirit allies. They're not mind readers. And even if they are, it's not their job. It's our job to know what we need. And this is the gamut of the winter runes. This is what this little trilogy teaches us. Even if you're not Christian, we still live in a Christianized culture. And that culture has impressed upon us that some higher being is just supposed to miraculously fix everything. And when it doesn't, we have these feelings of having been forsaken. Why me? There are all kinds of problems with that binary line of region that I can't even go into in this episode. And honestly, I don't really want to. What I'm getting at is that kind of intervention with spirit allies isn't one and done. Just like we've talked about with weird weaving, our communications with our spirit allies function the same way. It's not something that you tap in and out of in isolated moments of need or convenience. It's a relationship that must be built, sustained, and tended over time. And if we're really diligent about these relationships, we hand them down to our descendants so that they're not starting at zero when they have life needs. We teach them how to continue tending those relationships in their own way and how to adapt those relationships to the needs of their time. That is true totemism, and we don't have anything like that in the West. Does that mean that when you have these long-standing relationships, you do these punctuated rituals beseeching the spirits for help, that you're guaranteed everything will be fine? You, you do the relationship building, you do all the stuff, you do the ritual. No, no, that's not the point. Some shit is just not fixable. So then what is the point of ritual? If, if we're not guaranteed the outcome, what is the point of ritual? Ritual serves the purpose of helping us hold the boundaries for our spirit work to take place. In order for the spirits to really get the memo that we need help and for us to safely stand in shared space with them, we have to create a healthy container for that to happen. 
The way that we create a healthy container is through developing skills around ritual and ceremony. And that's something that I teach in a singular one-off class that you can take in a series of classes if you want to string it all together with even more skills. And in a long-term training intensive for how to apply this to how you live life, everything, all the time, every day. We have to develop strong skills around a ritual and ceremony, and we have to learn to greet our cosmology. I say greet very intentionally because in the West, we don't usually know our cosmology. We know how to run like hell away from a cosmology that doesn't suit us, but that does not automatically guarantee that we recognize one that suits us as we live into it. We have to go look for that. We have to greet it and allow it to develop as we grow. So when we know how to implement good rituals and we know our cosmology, we have to set a rally point to use them. It, yes, they, they can become these latent things that we carry with us all the time as animists, but in those times of need, we have to set a rally point for how we're going to implement those things and how we're going to create space for our guides to help us move it all forward. Few truly miraculous events take place in life unplanned. Yes, they happen. Miracles happen. But most of the time, somewhere along the way, there was some kind of event planning. And in the scope of spiritual relationship, cosmic event planning means setting boundaries for what's going to happen and ensuring the safety of all involved so that it can happen. And when we've got that part under control, we have to set the intention for our ritual. We have to actively participate in creating the space, holding the boundaries of that space, and stating our intention for what needs to happen within that space. That is the meeting point of magic. That's that's the synergy. That's what rituals do. That's why need fire. This is the creation of sacred space. It, it is the, the space allocated uniquely for the needs of that moment in which our allies and us meet to unite on some front to, to fulfill an outcome and some intention. I keep saying the boundary of making a special place for this to happen. It meets our needs as well as theirs. But what does that mean? Just like the spirits aren't on speed dial for us, they also are inherently protected from the elements of this plane. This is not their stomping ground. This is not where they do magic. It's where we do magic. This is our house. And it's our job to know the rules of how our house works. That is weird weaving. And when we do our job well, they can do their job well. The intention is fulfilled. We come back from that ritual carrying its blessings and we bring those blessings to the world through our own duty. So to know the whole process of how to bring ritual together, how to weave the relationship of cosmology into ritual space so that everybody who needs to show up can and does, and they know what their job is. Everybody does their job. We know how to hold that space, keep everybody safe, close it out when we're finished with it, and then take that information back into how we live It takes practice. It takes some skill. It takes some discipline. And we have to make room on a continual basis for our spirit allies to show up in our lives in order for that punctuated magic to happen. There's got to be some kind of sustained magic to happen. And, And that room that we create is also the boundary that separates their work from ours. In that sense, we do special rituals as a very punctuated meeting point, like Nothies. Nothies represents this cross-section. But really, the magic for that cross-section has been created across a continuum. It's been created throughout a relationship. So as you 
spend time with Nauthies over these this next week that we have with it. Explore your own relationship to rituals. How do you perform rituals? What rituals are the most important to you? What do you do in a pinch? Do you automatically have a foundation in place and relationships in place with soul beings that you can call on? What mundane rituals do you perform every day that you don't even think about that by changing your awareness of them, by making them more spiritual, could be sacred things that you do every day? What is your need fire now? Thank you.